Hello to friends, it's my pleasure to be with you again. Today we have special guest Chris Carpenter. Uh, she is a beautiful soul and she had a very interesting life story that she would like to share with us today. And um, thank you very much for um, that you're welcoming us to your beautiful house and we welcome you to Testimony Show uh, Anna Nizel. Well, thank you. I'm very um, glad to be here and I'm really excited to be on your program. Yeah, thank you, Chris. In what family you grew up in? Okay, so um, I am the seventh child of eight children. Uh, my mother and father had four boys and four girls. We used to call each other the um, the Bloomfield Bunch because that was my maiden name instead of the Brady Bunch. I don't know if you ever watched that show, but <laughs> anyway. Um, so yes, my uh, my father was an alcoholic, and I only uh, met him a couple of times because I was the seventh child. I don't have a lot of memories because. Um, he started to become abusive to my mother. So my mother said, you know, either you leave or I leave with the kids because he, he wouldn't stop drinking and it was not a good situation. Uh, so she, uh, she was a believer in Christ. However, we were poor, a very poor family. Uh, we, she struggled to keep food on the table. She struggled to clothe us. There were many times where we didn't have food and we didn't have what we needed and she would just open her Bible and she would pray about it. So Growing up as a little child, I watched her and her faith encouraged me, but there was another side of it that, you know, she would take us to churches sometimes, but mm -hmm. a lot of Christian churches would look down on her because she was a single mom with eight wow. kids and poor, not dressed right, and no husband in the picture. So that's a sad part, you yeah, know, for the, when you think about the Church of Christ, we're supposed to welcome everybody. So I, I, I watched those things in my childhood, um, uh, but my mom... Um, wasn't educated, so she was dropped out in like 10th grade. So uh, she uh, was not really grounded in God's word, so mm -hmm. to speak, but she was, she believed and had, you know, saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, yeah. um, so it, d childhood, we had a semi-happy home, so to speak, um, but um, there was uh, challenges. Can I say that you grew up part of an a Christian family, right? Sort of, yes. Like sort I was of. able to, my mother would talk often about the Lord, yes. but then there was parts of her where she was like, almost like a manic, de she was depressed. So she would sleep all the time or mm -hmm. she was gone working. And then there was times when we were on public assistance. And then when she disciplined, she didn't discipline with the love of the Lord. She would... Unfortunately, yeah. Yes, it was not, you know, switches, pulling hair kind of things right. because she was overwhelmed. You know, but the Lord allowed me to like look back at her and say she did the best that she could with what she had. I was able to overlook those things and and just love her for who she was, and that's something the Lord gave me. You know what I mean? How come that um, you were child abuse, like when you were a toddler? Yeah. So from the time from my earliest memories to about eight years old, I was abused by my eldest uh, sibling. It stopped when he was probably about 18. He went off into the military. And mm -hmm. later on in my life, um, when actually when I got the job with the Criminal Investigation Division of the Internal Revenue Service, I was off to train at the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center. And I made a decision to stop and see my brother, my eldest brother. And, and at that, when I visited with him, it was, uh, I, he was married and I was there staying at his house one night with his wife. Yeah. And I made a decision that I wanted to ask him why he did those things to me when um, I was a child. And so he basically told me that um, he was abused by the babysitter. So my mother was working. She had to have a babysitter. So it mom. was sexual abuse. Yes, yes, it was sexual abuse. Um, and, you know, like probably molestation. That's how you would probably refer to it. So the babysitter abused him. Mm -hmm. So then he in turn did that to me. And I was the seventh child, very small to, you know, and uh, he said he got scared of himself. And so he decided to join the military so that he would not hurt me anymore. So when I heard him tell me that story, I was, he asked me to forgive him and I, I was able to forgive him. And honestly, after that point, I never had bad thoughts in my life or like those images don't come up anymore, but for through my teen years and stuff, it really bothered me. And um, yeah. 
And I wasn't, I was saved at that point, but not living for the Lord because there's two different things. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I was saved as a young girl, but I didn't know what it meant to live for the Lord because my mother didn't know really what that meant to live for the Lord because that's where discipleship comes in and your parents teach you how to live for the Lord. And when you're involved in a church, they teach you how to live for the Lord. Right. Is it possible for a parent, mm -hmm. mom or dad, just to see and find out if your child is abusing by some, someone else? I mean, how can we protect or prevent this? in our families. I, I think that that can be done with wisdom and discernment. I think it's much easier when you have a relationship with the Lord and you're reading the Word of God, yes. obviously. But when you're not, there's there are some good parents that are not followers of Jesus Christ. And one is always know where your kids are. Know, know who you have babysitting. I don't let my girls go with anybody, like unless I really know them and I feel very comfortable with that. God did give motherly intuition. Right. Um, yeah. And I think that you need to be smart with that. Um, and um, there are, I'm sure, materials that you could probably read for that, but I just kind of learned it on my own. How this like horrible experience in your life influenced in your future life, oh. like from the past to future. That influenced me in, in that I decided in my heart, even though I wasn't living for the Lord yet, I decided that I was not going to allow what happened to me rule my future. I made a decision that, and this maybe, made it, maybe it wasn't a good decision, but it made me persevere and move forward. I wasn't going to be a victim like my mother. I loved my mother dearly, and I'm so thankful that she did talk to me about the Lord, because I believe that's how I, I was saved, you know, and I know that I was as a young girl. Um, but she lived her life as a victim for the rest of her life. She slept a lot and she, she was depressed and, and she just kind of went into a shell and never came out of it. She never divorced my father. She never did any of those things. She never went out and got remarried. She just went into a shell and that reflected in her life. She still had a relationship with the Lord and she would still talk about the Lord. Um, but in my perspective, she became a victim. And I said, well, I, I'm not, I don't want to be a victim. I want to make something of my life. And so that made me um, push forward and make something of my life, so to speak. It's a good decision. Just go forward, mm -hmm. no matter what. Um, tell me, please, about your marriage. So how did you meet your spouse? So uh, I met my uh, first husband. Uh, we were childhood sweethearts. I was working at a place, and I met him there, and I was 15, 16. And uh, we started dating. And then at 21 and 22, we were married. We were married for 20 years. We had three wonderful children. Uh, but during that marriage, I attended a 10-day revival service. And just backing that up, my grandmother had passed away and she was a believer in the Lord. And mm -hmm. she would pray and talk about the Lord as well. And uh, so when she passed away, I was by her bedside consoling her and telling her that she was going to go to heaven and things like that. But yet I wasn't living for the Lord and the Holy Spirit just started really working in my heart. And there was a nice Bible church down the road about a mile. And every Sunday, the Holy Spirit would say, get up, go to that church. Get up, go to that church. And I started attending that church. And, and it had, was revival service. That's, they had a 10-day revival service. And that's where they have a speaker every single night. And it would be two or three hours. And they would have music and special speakers. And it was a whole team that came into the church. And basically, they preached the Word of God and would talk about family and about sin and about getting your right life right. And there, they had a room where you could go in. And uh, right around the seventh or eighth day, I really went in and just said, oh, I sobbed. I was like, uh, Lord, I'm living my life my way. And I pretty much got down on my I knees need to and live said, your Here, way. Here's, here's my life. I'm going to stop. I'm not in the seat anymore. Here's my life. I'm putting it on the altar. And that was the image I had in my life. Here's my life. Now I live for you. From that point on, Christ completely changed my life. How? How did your life change? Um, well, that point? I didn't change it. The whole, you know, the Holy Spirit works in you, and um, I made a decision. You know, I I do believe there's a divine human cooperative. Mm -hmm. You know, the Lord calls us, but we can resist Him. So, you know, I call it the divine human cooperative. We have to work together with the Holy Spirit, and you know, I yielded to Him. And he changed my desires, you know, he changed my, the way I, I clothed myself from the way I talked to the way uh, I didn't drink or I didn't do casual smoking. I was a casual mm -hmm. smoker at that point. I changed my, my language, although I, my language was not really bad, but 
I started reading my Bible every day. I, was, I joined the church. Um, I, even though I was baptized as a little girl, I made a decision to, to be baptized again because now I was a, making a testimony to the church that I'm living for him. So I was baptized again as an adult. So, and that was um, in 1995. As I understand, you, your divorce, like the main reason for your divorce, it was your faith. Yes. Right? Yes. How come? So during that marriage, I committed my life to Christ. I started going to the church. I started asking my husband if I could quit my job from the government. Very good paying job. And he, it was a lot for him. You know, you already worked for IRS. Yes. Right? I was working for the, for the IRS already as a criminal investigator. And now I had, you know, uh, two babies, mm -hmm. two, two young children. And uh, I was um, on maternity leave at that point. So I really didn't want to go back to work. So I learned right away and I asked him, can I quit my job? And he said, no. So I kept working and I just started, you know, following what the Bible, you know, says. And um, then I'd ask him, you know, I really feel like we should be tithing and giving money to the Lord. And first he said, no. Then I, a little while later, I'd wait and just, you know, be respectful. And a little while later, I'm in the mirror and I'm like, oh, I just really want to give my, you know, I was even not tithing off of my income. I was asking him for permission to do that. I asked him again. I just, I feel like we should be giving to the church. He stated that, um, finally said, yes, okay, well, you can tithe. And then I asked him if I, they had a part-time position that came open. So I was the seventh person in the nation to go part-time. And so I went part-time for three years and he let me do that. Mm -hmm. So it was just little steps. But he made several professions of faith, but in the end, he recanted it all and said he just did it for me to make me feel better. There was a point in time where my brother was murdered and I went away and um, while I was gone, he ended up leaving our relationship. And uh, there was no changing his mind. Like, you know, I'm like, if you just stop what you're doing, we could go to counseling. You know, I tried everything I could do to say, you know, let's move forward. And uh, we had a good marriage. Every once in a while, he would become antagonistic towards the gospel. So I would say, is he saved? Is he not saved? But he, he never joined the church. He never, he would go to events. Like if the kids were he allowed our kids to go to Christian school. If the kids were doing a program or there was a special thing that they were in, he would come watch that. Yeah. Most of the time he was working on Sundays. But, um, but it was his decision to go through the divorce. Oh yes, so he served me with divorce papers because he was seeing someone else. At that time, New York State did not have, it was no fault, you couldn't just file for a divorce. Now you can, anybody can get it for anything. Back then you couldn't do that and you had to have a reason. And he didn't have a reason, so his first attorney t turned him down. And then, then the second attorney, he, he hired, um, basically filed papers on me and said, I was a religious zealot and that, um, that it was cruel and inhumane treatment. So that was really challenging as a Christian who was committed to the Lord, raising my children in the Lord and having a good testimony in the church. I didn't believe in divorce. And yet here I was in this situation and... Um, obviously it takes two people, you know, I'm sure that I did not do some things right. I could have, you know, maybe stayed home, maybe some on some, some Sunday nights and, but I was so committed. I'd be like, are you going to come to church? And he'd be like, no. And he's, you know, I would take the kids and go off to church. So, you know, always, hindsight's always 20, 20. He, he was a good father, you know, in terms of a non-Christian father, so to speak. But I ended up contesting that divorce, and that means I said, no, I, I don't want to sign any papers. I'm not going to give you a divorce. You're going to have to take me to court. So he ended up taking me to court, and we had a whole week-long trial, and basically the judge gave him a divorce by mallet and basically said that I was um, a Christian zealot and that I did not practice the Easter Bunny, I didn't practice Halloween, and I didn't practice um, Santa Claus and that um, having a pool party and giving out the gospel of Jesus Christ, and that based on that, he got his divorce, that I was a Christian zealot. That was super hard to go through. At the time, I couldn't rejoice in that. I, I, it was very hard for me. I still, I still struggle with, not necessarily him, with the brokenness that happens in the entire family. Right. You know, I have a, a, um, a soft spot for broken families in any, in any way because it affects the kids long term. Right. It affects everybody, you know, and it's, it doesn't, especially when there's children in law, it's a long term effect. But about a year later, I was driving down the road and I was listening to the Christian radio. And, and on the Christian radio, the man says, 
if you were on trial for your faith, would you be convicted? And I, I like, it was like a light bulb went on and I just, I was just like, oh, thank you, Jesus. You know, <laughs> and, it, and finally I was able to say, oh, okay. Like, like I knew that I was doing what God wanted me to do, but it, it doesn't mean that things are always easy. Yes. And so that God was preparing my future for me, which I didn't realize. So what can you say now for those la ladies who are in the same situation or similar situation like yeah. you were before? Sure. Because we all understand that divorce is, is not, not for us, will. not for yeah, not Christian. Yeah. yeah, it's not God's will. What, what can we do? Uh, well, I think you can do what, what uh, Peter says. You know, you pray for your husband and you do it with a quiet and a meek spirit. You know, the Bible says, you know, if by, you know, if you can win him to the Lord, it doesn't necessarily, because he, he has to respond and yield to the Holy Spirit and it doesn't always happen. And I would say, don't pressure. I probably made some mistakes in pressuring at times, you know, or maybe some secular music would come on and I would say, that's not pleasing to the Lord. Well, that was probably too much for him. Again, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. So I think learning to still be fun and have fun and not pressure him and just make make him want to come to the Lord by your actions, you know, even though I, I didn't fail in all of that, you know, there were times where I saw I could have changed, I could have done, been a little bit better for that. And just try and honor the Lord for it. Yeah. You, you can't make somebody stay in a relationship if they, you know, if they walk away, you know, you can, you only can pick up the pieces and go forward. You already mentioned that you worked for IRS mm -hmm. and you were a light there, right? So I'd like to think I was a light. <laughs> <laughs> I met, actually, I met a friend of mine who, who introduced yeah. us. So, um, yeah, when I first started there, um, I was the only believer in my office and I, I didn't smoke. I didn't swear. And uh, there was a lot of um, taking the Lord's name in vain there. And they, they knew that. They just like by watching and every once in a while, one of them would take the Lord's name in vain and then they'd come over and say, oh, I'm so sorry. Oh. You're like, so just my presence and, you know, how I, you know, acted evidently was making a difference, you know, and I, I tried to, if they had an event or a party because I didn't drink, I would try to at least show up and stay for a little bit and then go home you know what i mean it was usually on your way home just to respect them yeah yeah just you know sure. not not shun it but try and be partake in it without sinning so unfortunately you got a divorce yes. and uh, after that how did your life change again changed drastically um because uh, at that point uh, when uh, the divorce happened i was already a stay-at-home mom i had already um, my husband had let me quit my job mm -hmm. And because we had moved away from the Buffalo area to here. And um, so I was a stay-at-home mom. And um, I was a stay-at-home mom for about seven, eight years, re raising my children when they were little. Mm -hmm. And so that meant I had to go back to work. And I, I struggled with that, so I started applying for jobs. And the Lord just opened the door for me to come back to my actual old job as a criminal investigator. It took about a year. I had to go through the whole background check. I had to work out, I had to lift weights, I had to get myself fit, I had to pass a fitness test, the drug test, I had to do it all over again and the Lord opened the door and I, I, I got the position and I ended up getting the position with even more money than what I anticipated. I didn't have to go back down for training again because that was one of the things I said, I don't want to leave my kids for six months and I was able to bypass all of that and, oh, yeah. right. and provide for my children well, not, you know, and focus on my relationship with the Lord and focus on my career. And I said, and serve in the church. Those are my three goals. I said, I'm going to keep serving the Lord, but I have to work. Mm -hmm. I don't believe that I should sit on at home and, I, and I wait from yeah, somebody I else. No, something. God wants us to keep moving forward. And I, I do believe the Lord provided that door for me and I was able to collect a pension and which help is helping me now. <laughs> yeah, that's good. How did you meet your um, second spouse, like second husband, Jeff? Yes, Pastor so Jeff, um, yeah. I met Jeff. I had no plans on getting married ever again and not that I was bitter in any form or fashion, I, but I had made a decision that I was gonna keep following the Lord and, and part of that decision that I had made was I'm going to raise my children and keep work on my career serve the Lord at my local church. 
and uh, when my children grew up and they were out of the house that I would go on short-term mission trips and that was my thing. So I switched churches and um, when I switched churches because my children didn't have a youth group, they didn't have what they needed and I felt that they needed something. So when they were with their dad one day I decided to visit this new church and I liked it and I started attending, I started bringing the kids to it and I did it, attended the church for three or four months mm -hmm. And I told my pastor where I was at that I was going to do that. I left my, my church on good terms. I, I told him that my children weren't getting what they needed and I needed to, that I felt like the Lord was moving me in this direction. And we actually both cried, that's a side story, both cried and then with his wife because it was such a sweet spirit, it was such a good church. They, they helped me through all of that and they supported me through all of that. It was a great church. So uh, I, I started going to Friendship Baptist Church and about three months after attending there, they had a missions conference and it was at that missions conference that the Lord pressed upon my heart, I want you to join. So I said to the Lord in my head as the service was going on, okay, Lord. And then he said, but it won't be easy for you here. And I was just like, okay. okay. <laughs> yeah. And I had no idea. Like, again, I had no plans of getting married. I had no plans of doing all that. I had no idea what Lord had in plan for me. And um, after... Uh, Jeff's uh, first wife, Denise, passed away. We started courting a couple months after that, and then uh, we got married about two years later. And you had eight beautiful years together, yes. right? What happened last year? I mean, yeah. past year, 2021? So we were serving. It was great. We had a great eight years serving together for the Lord. He was the pastor of the church. We worked well together. We had um, we had a lot in common, and we know the Lord put us together. The Lord was very clear to this is what He wanted, and we had a very, very good eight years. We had plans for the future, but God had different plans. So uh, um, He last September He, we all came down with COVID. The whole family came down with COVID, and uh, He had an underlying heart condition from a childhood, but. Um, he was very, very healthy, very strong, like he could walk circles around men in their 30s. Uh, it was kind of like a joke. We used to call him the Energizer Battery, the bunny to that commercial. He um, ended up uh, going in the hospital and then he ended up having a heart attack and then a stroke and then the Lord took him home. So that was the guide's timing. You know, the, the Word of God says that um, the hairs of our head are numbered and we don't get to choose the hour nor the day. And when I know when my husband went to the hospital, the very next day I listened to a Charles Stanley tape. And, and the Lord is like, are you going to surrender this to me? Now my life was already surrendered to the Lord, but you know, as we walk in our journey, we still have to surrender things that start happening in our life. And God, when God chooses to use you, he brings you through valleys and tragedies and triumphs so you can glorify him and honor him. So I said, okay, Lord, I'm surrendering this to you. Just, I want to honor you through this situation. And that was my goal through that trial and those months of the Lord bringing my husband home. And I wanted to minister to the people because they lost their pastor. And some of these people knew him much longer than me. Some of them had been in the church 20 something years and loved him, you know, he was a brother and- It's here in Rome. Yeah, Friendship Baptist Church in Rome, New York. And so I just wanted to honor the Lord and glorify the Lord through that. And I do believe that he used me through that. And I just tried to show the love of Christ in my compassion to the people. And I still try to do that. You know, I just, I look at you and think, one beautiful woman, but so many things going on in your life. It's just like, I mean, from your childhood, you. <laughs> and, and it's like we can we can take a lot of lessons for for us younger yeah, generation yeah. who can, like who, we believe that we will grow up and we will do sure. like a lot of more and more more uh, good things for yeah. the glory of God. And sure. there's so many lessons that we Thank can you. take from your <laughs> life, just one life. Yeah, um, you shared with me about. Um, Five principles that she, uh, gave you victory. Yes. Could you please share it with our viewers and everyone who's sure. um, watching us right now? So this is um, um, five five principles that gave me victory in my life, and I think one of the one of the things as Christians is that we have to remember to focus on God, and not the circumstances that are around us, because those circumstances are this way, but we need to focus this way, and sometimes. You know, when we're focusing on the Lord, we can have a whirlwind and be in the worst tragedy of our life and yet still have joy and peace 
it doesn't mean that you won't be sorrowful. It doesn't mean that you won't have be crying or whatever, and that the decisions may be hard or yeah, the road. to overcome and go forward. Yeah, yeah. So you know, the pathway to hope and victory often runs through adversity, and um, we need to. The key is to keep going to Jesus's feet and and going to Him and um, and then say no to discouragement and yes to God. So focusing on Him. Number two, I think, um, is the commitment never to get up. And Job, it says in Job 13, 15, it says, Though he slay me, I will hope in him. Because ultimately, ultimately, we have to remember that everything in our life, either God designed or he allowed. And when we get mad, we're ultimately getting mad at God. And I learned that as, in my younger life as a Christian. And I learned that, no, I, instead of getting mad or asking the Lord why, I should be saying, Lord, use me. What do I need to be doing that I'm not doing? Is there something that you're trying to teach me? You know, how can I honor you through this? And I think if we keep that as our focus, we won't look at like, oh, why is me, poor is me, you know, that, that time. I, and I chose not to get bitter yeah. because God was allowing it in my life. Yes. Um, and then um, the next one would be um, remembering your position in Christ. So my, my I'm a child of God. Yes, yes. that's right. And, 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 and Hebrews 13, 5 says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. God is always with, with us, even though sometimes we don't always hear what he's saying to us. He's sometimes silent to us. But he says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So I think I clinged to the scriptures. There, wasn't a, there were times where I couldn't pray, but I always read his word. And I immersed myself in his word and um, no matter what the circumstances are. And I, I have been doing that again <laughs> this fall. And then the other one is cling to Jesus. You know, the enemy at the times when you're weakest, you know, he wants you to be mad at God. He wants you to walk away from God. He wants to stick doubt because that's what Satan does. He's a deceiver. Mm -hmm. He likes to stick doubt in, in our minds. Cling to Jesus and read the scriptures again. And um, I think of 2 Corinthians 10, 10 uh, 5, where it says, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing every thought into captivity, into, you know, into Jesus Christ, you know. So um, if we can keep that in the forefront of our mind and cast that out and say, no, no, that's no, that's not from the Lord. And the next one is crying out to the Lord. I continually brought my tears before the Lord. It's like a little backpack. You go down, you cry, you wipe your tears and it's like you just drop that backpack down there. And Psalm 27, 14 says, Wait on the Lord and be of good courage, and he shall strengthen uh, thine heart. And wait, I say, on the Lord. There are seasons in our life, and remember that we won't always be stuck in that season. And Lord, the Lord does hear us. He wants us to fellowship with him. He wants to grow us in those times of our greatest trials. Chris, thank you very much. Thank you for all this information in your heart that you shared with us today. And um, for now, we will stop and we will continue in the second part. And we invite all of you, our dear friends, personally, come along with us. And next part, it will be talking about new ministry that Chris opened um, recently and about this painful topic, uh, sex trafficking, that's unfortunately going on around us and in our community. And we need to fight it against in the name of Jesus and helped those who who need this help need this love so be blessed in the name of Jesus and see you in the next part